Hello. Hey. Hi. Welcome, one and all, to our first episode of Media Vine's Teal Talk of a new year. Can't even believe it. But you've got an old host. I am Jenny Guy, and I am still here. You are stuck with me. Hello. Welcome. Guys, it's 2022, which sounds way too close to 2022, as in another leveled up version of 2020. And I don't think there's a single one of us who want that. None of us, none of us want that. So I guess my question is, are we still within our trial period for this year? Because I am not sold on keeping it. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. How about you guys? How about everyone's coming in now? We're kind of rolling in. Hello. Welcome. Say hi. Tell us how your new year is, is going. Are you off to a grand start? Do you make resolutions? Are they on track? Tell us, tell us how you're doing. Say hi and, and let us know. I sincerely hope that you're, you had a beautiful holiday season and that you are starting the new year invigorated. But as always on this show, on Teal Talk, we are here to talk about content creation. So it is our time to quiet the noise from all the various current world dumpster fires and focus on our businesses for a little while. So friends, as far as good news and exciting announcements, my guest today has brought both. Please join me in welcoming Mediavine CEO, Eric Hochberger, back to the program. Hello, Eric. Thank you. So does that make me an old guest? I've been, I've been wondering that since uh, your intro. I mean, I'm an old host. You're an old guest. We're old. We're experienced. We're vintage. Experienced guest. Great. Okay. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. We're, we're very experienced. Um, everybody's saying hi. Yes, we have people saying they want to cancel their subscription as well. We understand. Okay. So what we're going to talk about today is all of the developments we've got going on. Eric put out a great blog post earlier this year, as is tradition. I think this was our fifth, our fourth or fifth um, yearly roadmap, which tells us where we're heading in the coming year. Um, our, our other co-founder, Amber, puts out a, a recap at the end of the previous year. And then Eric puts out our roadmap for the coming year. And most of our questions come from that along with some things that people have uh, have asked in the different in the groups. But if you have questions, as always, for Eric or I, drop them in the comments and we will do our best to get to all of them. Okay, so I'm just gonna dive in. We okay with that, Eric? Actually, we had a request for a baby story. Do you have a baby story for us? Who did, who did that come had- from? Uh, Sarah, Sarah, uh, Arswald said she's off to a great start and hoping you are to give a quick story about the new baby, Eric. Oh, the, the new baby, Eric. Is that what we're calling? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think there was, I mean, that's fine. A, I think there was a comma. Oh, comma. Like comma. you're missing a comma. New baby, because I didn't, Eric. I didn't know. Maybe she knew because this one actually does look the most like me of any of my girls. So it oh, could really? be baby Eric. I, it could have gone either way. Um, maybe that's my story. I somehow produced uh, for my third child a clone of me in female form. So a clone of you in much, female form. Yeah, hopefully much prettier. And uh, yeah, uh, what do you want to hear about Hunter? She has, uh, I don't know. She's great. Best baby ever. She's Sleeps great. Tonight already she, three months old. Wow. And she's she's the new Hawkburger girl. There are yep. three. Join, and... join the other two as well as the two female shits used in my house and my wife. Totally. So, so what you're saying basically is that your new baby girl looks like Patrick Wilson as well. Is what you're, oh, what you're telling me. I, I, I sure hope so. It'll make her doppelganger <laughs> week so easy. Yeah, though, it'll, I'm guessing by the time she grows up and gets on Facebook, Patrick Wilson might not be as uh, popular as he is right now. Maybe not. Maybe not. Mm-hmm. Everyone, that's an inside joke between Eric and I that I have constantly told him since I met him about five years ago that he looks like Patrick Wilson. So that's that's why I just brought that up. Okay. And I think he's finally accepted it. Have you accepted it? I've accepted it. I've embraced it, especially since he was an Aquaman now. So now that I know yeah. who he is. Yeah. 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 No he can mainstream. sing. He's been on Broadway. The Much more talented version of me. Absolutely. Multi-talented. All right. Yeah. Okay. So here we go, guys. As we learned from your blog post, Eric, earlier this week and from looking at really any any news sites that cover content creation or programmatic advertising, the big story for 2022 is is already going to be cookies and data and privacy. That's what we're going to be talking about uh, in 2022, which we will absolutely get to. But before we address that whole 
crazy situation. Mm -hmm. I want to start with some of the other things we're working on at Mediavine for the coming year. So in your blog post, you started with saying 2020s was going to be the decade of video, which, which is actually the second decade of video for those of us who've been, or are vintage and have been around experience, but that universal player has already taken care of this. So let's back up a little bit, give us a quick overview of universal player and should everybody be running it? Tell us what it is and what we should do. Yeah, so I guess the reason we joke that the uh, deck or second decade of video is what we're now calling it. Okay, the, the second decade of video, the reason we think it's finally able to come to a close is because the universal player is a solution that brings video revenue to everyone. Uh, that's mostly where it gets its name from. Uh, universal is also because it is so much in one. Uh, that player is if you are already running video and you're well optimized for video, you still want to run it because it can serve as kind of a, a backfill or fill on pages where you don't have video or after your video ends, it can hop in. Universal Player is a great backup solution, uh, but it can also be your primary solution. Uh, and on a lot of sites, actually most sites, it out earns the regular video player. So we definitely encourage you, if you haven't already, uh, turn on the Universal Player and turn off your featured video. It's doing uh, better than ever. Okay. So everybody, regardless of if they have video, don't have video, it's not going to supersede my post specific video. Is that accurate that I've embedded? Absolutely. So if you made a video for that post, the universal player will never uh, take the place of it unless there's no ad. Uh, so our videos only play uh, if there's an ad to play so that they will stay uh, quick to play is basically what they're called in the industry. But a user will have to then press play if they want to watch your video uh, if there's no ad. So the universal player will run in that circumstance. But other than that, uh, your video will always take precedence over the universal player. There's no downside to running it. Okay. So then my question is, what role do you see? One of my questions, there's going to be a lot, you know, you know, the drill, your experience. What role do you see video playing for publishers in this year and decade? Is publisher created video content dead? Like, is there a reason to keep doing it? There will never be a full substitute for publisher created video. It is worth more than the universal player um, because that is the universal player uses what's called outstream. Uh, when you create your own video that uses what's called in-stream. So if you're creating short form content and your users are watching it and watching the next video afterwards, uh, you're going to make the most amount of money if you run in-stream. So there's certainly value to it. And there's also user value to publisher created video, right? If that video is actually benefiting the user, you should a thousand percent be creating it. Uh, and then you're going to get, of course, the SEO benefits. If you have a video specific to that page, uh, our player will mark it up in what's called schema. And you are eligible for video carousels and other video specific searches in Google. So you can get additional traffic by running video on your page. And if it's a good user experience, uh, you're going to end up making more money as a result. So it's still a place for uh, publisher created video. Absolutely. What we're kind of stopping now is from what I understood, and, and please do correct me if I'm wrong. I know you will. We're, we're kind of putting a stop to the, I created one video that I'm now going to play on every page on my site, every post. Exactly. There's no value of that to the reader. Uh, if you just create a video for the sole purpose of getting advertiser dollars, uh, that's what we try to put into with Universal Player. This is a better experience for readers uh, than necessarily watching a video that wasn't post specific or created for their value. So that's what we're trying to replace with the Universal Player. So if you have a specific video for the post, that you should 100% still run, but anything else, I would defer to the universal player. Perfect, okay. We had a question on here that I cannot believe I did not have in my prep doc. Uh, someone asked, what is the percentage of revenue increase for InView ads? We didn't have InView and I would love to talk about it for a hot second. What is InView and is that something everybody should be running? Yeah, so InView is great. Uh, that is actually designed to improve your viewability. So it takes your existing in content recipe and uh, if you're running feed ads and it basically creates, uh, it uses the optimized ads for CLS, uh, what we call the box that it, uh, or the placeholder that you'd already be putting on page. It basically makes the ad sticky within that. So as the user is scrolling, it sticks uh, with the user just throughout that box. So it creates, makes the box a little bit bigger, but it doesn't really change the user experience, uh, but it improves the viewability of your site drastically. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers on me, so I'm going to try not to misquote them. Uh, but within your in-content uh, feed and recipe, which we now have the viewability health checks, the number one way to improve those is turning on InView. So if, even if you are green or possibly even teal, uh, you still want to improve your viewability. Advertisers 
buy based on your viewability, their, your ads perform based on viewability, InView is a win-win. Uh, again, no disruption to the user experience and it improves value for advertisers, uh, making you a lot more money as a publisher. We can't give you an exact RPM because it's going to vary because it's a viewability improvement. Uh, so some sites might gain more from it, uh, but everyone's going to gain from it. It's not going to hurt anyone by turning it on. It's super subtle too. Like it's not something that you're going to look at and go, whoa, but it's just enough to kind of make the ad move just a little bit to increase that viewability. And we're only talking about in-content ads. That's the only thing that's being impacted by InView. None of the other ad units are getting, okay, just making sure. Just making sure. Okay. Let us talk a bit about Mediavine's WordPress products. We're talking about Create and Trellis. What is on tap for them in 2022? Are there any special features or offers that we should know about? Let's start with Create. Yeah, so um, Create may not have had the, the biggest year in 2021. It was more of a growing year internally for the team. So we built up the team that's been working on Create quite a bit and we were working on bug fixes. Uh, the last release was mostly just bug fixes. So maybe it seemed a little boring for you, but that was really putting a lot of awesome things in place for 2022. Uh, so it's actually going to be a really big year for Create, and we're excited for this. Uh, we've had a lot of feature requests over the years uh, that are finally coming out this year. Uh, some of those include the ability to multiply the number of servings. So if a reader wants to, say, double all your ingredients, uh, they can do so. Uh, improve calculation of ingredients for nutrition facts. Uh, so you can actually see what uh, individual ingredients are contributing if you want to be able to exclude or modify things. So a lot of really cool improvements are coming to create that our publishers have been asking for for years. Uh, and now they're able to get them thanks to the awesome team we built in 2021. So 2021, kind of the maintenance year, setting things up for a great year with Create. So very excited. What is Create, Eric? Oh, man, I should, I should start with that. So if yeah. you're not running Create, uh, Create is what we call your most valuable content. Uh, it helps you structure whether it's a recipe post, it will be a recipe card. If you're, let's say, a craft or a how-to blogger, uh, it'll structure that into how-to schema for Google. So it can improve your SEO. Uh, it's a great user experience. The pages look beautiful when you run Create. And of course, everything is optimized for speed and ads. Uh, so if you are not running a recipe card or a how-to card, you should absolutely be running it. In addition to that, we have lists inside of Create. And publishers use those in the most creative of ways. We see a ton of them using it for affiliate marketing. So they're awesome to be able to put together a list of, you know, top 20 Amazon subscribe and save you should add to your cart right now. Uh, so a lot of publishers are seeing success with it as affiliate, uh, but it's also great just to link to, you can do a roundup post with it. You can do, these are 20 must have, uh, must make recipes. So lists are very flexible. Uh, so you have how to uh, recipe and lists are the main ways in which you can use create today. It's basically a way for any, well, I won't say any, I will say most niches of any lifestyle to optimize and to earn maximum amount from the money part of their post, from the place where people are scrolling right. down to reach, right? Like this is where people want to go. Your packing list, your top 10 list rundown of the most cool things to see, the food, all of those things, like the, the recipe card, all of those things. Is this That's what Create is. Um, okay. We just had somebody ask a question about Trellis. So let's give a little background. What is Trellis and anything exciting going on with it right now? Yeah, so uh, Trellis is our WordPress theme framework. So similar to you might think of something like a Genesis uh, type of theme framework. So it's not necessarily just your child theme, but it's the actual framework. Uh, but it's written from the ground up for speed. So it's optimized for Google Core Web Vitals. Uh, so we have something like 80% of publishers that are running Trellis are passing Core Web Vitals because it's basically uh, more or less the easy button. So if you don't have a lot of technical resources, you have probably learned that passing Core Web Vitals is very challenging to do on your own. Uh, but it's not with Trellis. You basically get our team of engineers uh, to help you pass because we have built all those speed optimizations into Trellis itself. In addition to that, we offer uh, three uh, free child themes with the purchase of Trellis, uh, and they will help your site look beautiful, and you can customize them if you don't like the look of those three. So Trellis is flexible, uh, but most importantly, it is built for speed and optimized for ads, so it can help you get more traffic and make more money. Okay, everybody, we've got a couple of questions now. Alex and someone else asked, will there be more child themes available for Trellis? All right, so one of the fun things that we're working on in 2022 that we can talk about are Trellis blocks. So the idea of using Gutenberg to customize them, so whether it's your homepage, 
uh, a category landing page, or even an individual post to make it look beautiful and templated. So if you're not getting exactly what you want out of one of the current child themes, we first want to encourage you to use trellis blocks because we think you're going to be able to customize the look and the, the layout of your current site just by using Gutenberg and using these blocks. You might be able to create that homepage that you want without even changing child themes. That's going to be our first goal before we create any new themes is better uh, helping publishers customize the current ones. And that's exciting um, in that, that you'll be able to create some of what, what I've heard most requested and what we've talked about the most are static homepages or a way to make. So why, what are the advantages to creating one of those static homepages? So I think they're great for obviously SEO purposes, which is probably where I think a lot of our publishers first heard about these from me personally. And that is uh, create a static homepage because you don't just want to deliver Google your 10 most recent posts. And you probably don't want to even deliver your readers your 10 most recent posts. Think about a reader when their first experience coming to your site uh, with, with your homepage. Uh, you really want to be able to highlight some of your most popular uh, or what I like to call your cornerstone content. So it might not even just be uh, your top posts. It might be some of your top categories. It might be an intro type of post. Whatever does well uh, with Google and with your readers, you want to be able to highlight on your homepage. So that's really where a static homepage uh, has a great advantage compared to what's called just the regular WordPress loop or just showing your 10 most recent. You're really able to customize that experience for both users and uh, for Google. And for brands that are potentially coming to look yeah. to you for sponsored work, because we know that the majority of your readers are not going to your homepage. The people who are going to your homepage are those brands that are looking at you or evaluating you or vetting you for a potential sponsored campaign. So you want to put your best foot forward. You want to control the things you can control, which you can't control always the Google algorithm. You can't control a lot of different things, but you can control with the static homepage, the, the front door of your house. You can right. make that as beautiful and put your best foot forward. And that's what that's for. Okay. Amy Pelsner says, when are these blocks supposed to come out? It's a great question. Uh, so I'm not allowed to give dates anymore because uh, we learned the last time I gave a date with Trellis, we didn't maybe hit it exactly. So I'm going to be a little vague on purpose. It's going to come this year in 2022. Uh, they're actively being worked on. Uh, hopefully we'll be uh, testing them. Uh, we always do everything extensively tested, uh, especially with something as important as Trellis, which is your theme. Uh, so we will begin testing first and hopefully uh, get them out this year. Uh, Ellen Fulton says, I just loaded Trellis on January 2nd and I have not had one spam comment since doing so. So much better than what I was using. I'm in love with it already. I've not had time to delve into all the nuances of it and hope to when my son heads back to college. We love to hear that, Ellen. And we also have a special offer going on now. If you're interested in Trellis, we do have 20% off your first year of Trellis or your first month of Trellis. The code is running down at the bottom of the screen. If you are interested in that, now is a great time to do it. It's our new year, new theme. And go for it down at the bottom. That is one thing that even if we take a break on our low carb, keto, whatever we're doing, New Year's resolution, this will keep working even if you uh, stop on your site for a little bit. So give that a shot. Okay. Uh, I think that I got all the Trellis comments in the question in the in the loop here, but we all started going to quite a few questions about uh, grow. And are we working on grow bugs? Will we offer a lower session number? Uh, will grow get an official mail agent? So there's a lot of questions. So I think we should just go ahead, address the elephant in the room, the elephant that is so rudely eating all of the third party cookies and Chrome. That's a really rude element. And I'm going to be perfectly honest here with all the delays and dire predictions, it kind of seems like much ado about nothing. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask, um, are third-party cookies really going away in Chrome? Like, really, really? Is that a real thing that's happening? Uh, according to Google, it is really, really happening. Um, obviously, with the delay, a lot of people have probably uh, felt the same as you, where it doesn't feel like it's as impending or it's happening. Um, but I would encourage you all to look up. No, that was a bad reference to that movie. Uh, it is happening. No matter what, it is, it is going to happen. And the reason why uh, is because you have to look at growing privacy concerns from readers. Forget about what Google says. Look at the trends of what readers and their expectations are around privacy. There's a reason why Apple uh, is betting so hard on privacy uh, because it's working, right? They're convincing uh, users 
that they should be purchasing iPhones. They should be running Macs. And they should be using Safari because it is the better or safer browsing experience. Chrome and Google can't ignore that. Uh, if this continues to change, Google doesn't have a choice. They have to move to a more privacy-centric model, and that can't include third-party cookies as they are today. So I think Google doesn't have a choice. We all want to look at them as the bad guy that are eating our cookies, uh, but they're just responding to what the industry is going as a whole, whether they're on it or not. So I think we actually all want Chrome to get rid of cookies because if it doesn't, it won't compete. And Chrome is, quite frankly, the thing that innovates most of the web, whether you realize it or not, most uh, programmers can tell you this. Uh, Chrome and Chromium power browsers are without a doubt the best from an engineering standpoint uh, and in terms of innovation. So we want Chrome to stick around, trust me. Uh, so we do want them to get rid of third-party cookies. It will happen. So what is a third party cookie? That's a great question and very take a hard deep to explain. Breath, take a right. sip of cold brew. Get prepared. Ooh, I don't know if you want more cold brew before I give a description of third party cookies. We got to slow <laughs> it down. All right. Um, so a cookie is basically uh, an adorable word to describe how uh, websites store information about you as a user. Uh, so they're used in a lot of very good ways or innocuous ways, such as uh, making it so you can log into a website. I'm sure we all love that. And it remembers us after we log in and we come back to a site. Uh, it's a pain in the butt when it forgets us when we uh, already logged in. Um, so yeah. third-party cookies are a way in which you can basically share cookies uh, between different websites, but not necessarily where you can snoop other people's. So that's the important distinction of a third-party cookie uh, is that Bank of America would have to say, basically, anyone can use this cookie and, and give access to it. So don't worry, it doesn't happen. Uh, but third-party cookies are, now I'm going to give you an example of when you'd want a third-party cookie. So no Facebook comments at the bottom of all pages. Uh, as you browse different websites, do you want to have to re-log into Facebook as you go to each of those different pages? Uh, probably not. Um, that's where third-party cookies make sure you're automatically logged in as you go to the next uh, comment, uh, the next site with Facebook comments. That is going away. That is going to be one of the perks of third-party cookies that is going away. Because unfortunately, third-party cookies are not always used in the best ways. Uh, so keeping you logged in, good. Uh, using them for tracking, not always so great. Because they're not transparent with you. You have no idea who's dropping a cookie, uh, what they're storing about you, and who has the access to basically do it. And you don't have control of this as a publisher. As crazy as it is, we don't even have control of it as your ad management company. Uh, once you allow any third-party scripts on a page, uh, cookies get dropped and people have access to things. Uh, so there are better ways that we can share data between sites. And that's where the Privacy Sandbox, which is the new initiative uh, by Google and the W3C, are coming up with better ways in which we can share data across sites in privacy-centric ways. Uh, so third-party cookies, again, can be used for a lot of good, uh, but over the years they've been kind of uh, used and abused. So we're looking for the next version of them. Okay, so we understand Google has basically been put put into a corner. They don't have a choice. They have to do this, whether they want to or not. Don't want to do this. This is the way that the user, the user base of the web, which is the entire world, wants things to move. Um, why are there all these delays? Why do we keep getting downloaded? Do you have any? I know this is you don't work at. He works for MediaVine, everyone. In case you did not know, from the teal office, Eric. Eric is employed at media. Not they, they can't see the logo so, of my polo right now. I promise not a Google employee. Um, he's standing. So this is speculation, but, but why does this happen? Is this happening? All right. So uh, Google is responding to, as I've said, uh, reader pressure to do this. Um, but unfortunately there's other pressure, right? On Google. Uh, some of it uh, may be coming from, I don't know, a government body. Some of it may be coming from uh, the industry and where they make their money advertising. So Google couldn't just shut off third-party cookies if there weren't solutions in place. They wield an absolute ton of power within the advertising industry. If they shut off cookies and no one was prepared for it, uh, they would crush ultimately a lot of businesses, right? Uh, if, if people weren't ready for it. And when their deadline came up, they did not feel the industry was ready as a whole for them to just pull the cookies out. Um, so they delayed uh, the death of the third party cookie until the end of 2023 or during 2023. So it is not this year, but this is our last full calendar year with third party cookies. And next year it's a slow uh, phase out of them. So it's gonna be happening throughout next year, uh, the disappearance of them. So the delay is really uh, for all of our benefit. So 
Thank you. We will take it. Thank you, Google. Okay. What will it mean for media buying publishers once they're gone? And what can we do? I wrote that three times. What can we do with lots of O's? Yeah. So I think uh, there's a lot we can do first off, but what will happen if we did nothing? Uh, I'm going to give you the worst case scenario. The industry predicts about a 60% drop uh, in revenue. That's actually came from Google. When we run tests, we even see higher percentage drops uh, when you don't have third-party cookies. So if absolutely nothing were done, which would have happened if they just disappeared last year and nobody did anything, uh, it would have been about a 60% drop is what they're estimating. So that would be pretty devastating, right? But that's not what we think is going to happen, especially from Mediavine publishers, because we're going to do a lot of mitigation efforts. Uh, the first is, as I mentioned, there are uh, replacements for third-party cookies coming through what's called the Privacy Sandbox. Uh, we recently joined the W3C so that we can help have a greater influence on what these replacements look like. Um, so we're working on behalf of publishers to make sure that the new uh, standards uh, are as beneficial to independent publishers as we can help them be. So there are replacements coming that should help mitigate somewhat, but they're never going to be a full replacement for third-party cookies. You can't you can't replicate that without uh, giving up something if you're going to try to make it's a balance to make things more privacy centric. You have to give up some ability to track and uh, some of the, some of the power of third party cookies. And that's a, that's actually a good thing. Uh, but again, we want a multi prong approach here at Mediavine. So part of it's going to be the privacy sandbox. But a very large part of it is this grow thing you've probably heard us talking about. Uh, and that is first party data and authenticated traffic. So there's actually two different things, but those are uh, solutions that we're running through Grow to help our publishers not just mitigate, but make more. Because uh, when third-party cookies go away, everything's gonna come down to what's called the first party or the publishers. The publishers will be the only ones that can provide that value or data about readers uh, because it is going to be ultimately our sites and our control. So we see this as a good thing. Again, a chance for publishers to make more money. So when we say first party data, that essentially equals publisher data is what we're saying. Yeah. So in our context, when we say first party data, we mean uh, Mediavine and publishers. We look at ourselves as a publisher when we're saying first party data. We're going to be the ones helping provide the data uh, to advertisers as opposed to third parties who are able to do that with third party cookies. Okay. That was an excellent explanation. Thank you for explaining all of that. I appreciate it. We have a lot of questions about Grow, um, but but first you're, you're saying privacy sandbox, but also there were birds at one point. Is the privacy sandbox replacing the birds? Why and why? I guess my my bigger question is why are us we Mediavine um, going so hard at Grow instead of just relying on the sandbox or the birds or whatever Google is doing at this point. Yeah. So the sandbox uh, is where all the birds uh, live and hang out. They all oh, okay. are all in there. So when you hear names There's like so Flock or Fledge, or I can't even remember all the birds now because there was just way too many of them. Pelican and Parrot are sticking out as well. There was a Pelican. Yeah. I remember the Pelican. That was a year ago. So, so 2021. So the birds are still around. Um, there's a new version of Flock coming out. So we helped test the early version of Flock. There were some privacy related concerns around it. They're bringing back a new version that we're gonna help test. Uh, Fledge is coming out, which is uh, gives a little more control to, to publishers than, than Flock did. So there's a lot coming out, but again, as I mentioned, none of it is gonna give the full replacement to a third party cookie. Uh, even Google says in every one of their announcements when they say, Here's the privacy sandbox. They say, but the most important thing is going to be first party relationships and first party data. Read any blog post by Google. Uh, even the people who are pushing privacy sandbox more than anyone, which are the, the main force behind it, Google are still telling you the value is in your data. Um, so there's a reason why Mediavine is also betting big on products like Grow. We wanna make sure that we don't just mitigate and say, oh, now it's only a 20% loss because we're running privacy sandbox. No, we wanna come out and make more money. Uh, if our publishers make more money, we make more money. Uh, we all do better as an industry. Okay. I have a lot of grow questions in the comments, so get ready. Okay. I'm going back up. Here we go. Um, what is the plan to generate more traffic from grow? One, two. Uh, they said we get lots of saves, very little traffic. Two, when will we be able to incorporate grow log get logins with site features like hidden content, saved recipes, et cetera? Yeah. Uh, so the first one, getting more grow traffic. 
Uh, so one, it's actually, you're probably getting more growth traffic than you realize. Uh, one of the things is we had to make a change uh, just due to a limitation of Google Analytics that if grow increases the amount of traffic on your page and we were accrediting it to Google, uh, sorry, accrediting it to grow inside of Google Analytics, uh, it made it look like it was a new session. Uh, and so a couple of our publishers uh, didn't love how that behavior was. So it looked like suddenly there was a drop in how much traffic grow was sending you, but it wasn't. It's actually significantly decreasing your bounce rate, increasing your session duration, your pages per session. Uh, something like the Hollywood gossip, I think it's almost a 10% increase from just recommended content alone. So grow is probably providing you more traffic than you realize. It's just not showing it the same way as it did in your Google Analytics. So one thing we're working on is a new grow dashboard to hopefully be able to better show you these things uh, given those Google Analytics limitations. We actually had a question from Rachel that said, I'd love to be able to know how many of my readers are subscribing to Grow. When I look at my analytics, yeah. which event is the indicator that they have subscribed? She assumes it's a subscribe inline success. Is that correct? Yeah, so we uh, fire Google Analytics events uh, and someone could link to, I think we have a help article that explains what they all are because there's so many of them. I can't remember all the exact the exact name of it, but that does sound correct. But that's the one that says hey, they subscribed. Uh, we had another question asking about when will, we, when will we learn more about the Grow users and their behavior. Right now, we only have the analytics link to Grow data. We do have the dashboard coming. That's accurate. And it yeah. will be available to all publishers. It will be separate from the Mediavine dashboard. Is that right? Uh, the current plan, yeah, is to build a new dashboard. Um, separate from the Mediavine earnings, you're going to have a, a Grow dashboard uh, to get that data. Okay. So we have all of those happening. We've got a dashboard coming. We have other things coming with Grow, but can we start first with a rundown of what current features we have that were available with Grow? Because I think for me, sometimes it can be hard to explain Grow because there are so many different mm -hmm. things that about like it's email, but it's also like social and it's also like, so it's, it's difficult for me. So can you explain the features and why are there so many features? Yeah, so I think Sorry, they're important. I no, uh, grow, grow does that to all of us. So Grow is like kind of a Swiss army knife, right? It offers you a toolkit, a set of tools for you to use on your website. And different websites will use different tools in order to be able to provide value to their readers in exchange for them logging in. That's ultimately the goal of Grow, getting the user to log in or in some way consent to personalize ads and allowing you to generate first party data. In order to do that, you need to convince the reader there is value to them agreeing to do so. Why else would they be giving you this data? So it's a series of tools. And again, you may not even be using them all or even know all of them exist because there are so darn many of them. Uh, so I'm going to go over some of them. Uh, there is, first off, where we get the, the root of Grow, uh, Grow Social. You have social sharing features uh, inside the Grow logo at the bottom. So if someone clicks on that little share icon, uh, you could probably get a bunch of Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Pinterest shares directly from that widget down below. So that's an awesome just bonus everybody gets by running this. Uh, then there's features like search. So you can actually integrate natively within your search box or you can allow it so when a user clicks on again, that little share icon, uh, or they can also search within your site. There's recommended content, which is either uh, the what's next feature in the bottom right. You can do the little carousel up at the top on desktop. You can do inline, which is the best performing where it shows actually in your content, uh, additional Act, posts. Slow down. Okay, so we're just talking about the feature recommended content. That's the one that you just said the Hollywood gossip gets like a bajillion amount of, yeah. of traffic from. And you just said three different ways where that thing could go. So slow down and tell me what recommended content is and where it could go. So recommended I'll content. Try not to snort again. No, no, you should. Again, this is this is how excited we all get by Grow. So recommended content in Grow is uh, basically uses machine learning or artificial intelligence, similar to something like Netflix where Netflix gives you recommended shows based on the current shows you watch or other shows you have watched, right? It's not always going to be related content. So a lot of times you may see Netflix showing you something that makes no sense of the show you just watched, but you're probably going to like it because Netflix knows which, which you sit there and watch and binge, right? Which is creepy, but also awesome. Right. Uh, so hopefully we're not as creepy with our recommended uh, content. Uh, but, but the similar idea, right? We can see based on what users have been clicking on on your site and on other sites and recommend them great content from your site uh, that may not, again, be directly related to the post, but it's going to be what your user is most likely to click on. So you give up a little bit of control, and we were happy to do so on the Hollywood Gossip because 
Uh, strangely enough, someone reading something about the Duggars might be likely to click on something not about the Duggars. Maybe there's no more current Duggar news and they want to move on to, I don't know, some Kardashian. Jersey Shore. Or, yeah, Jersey Shore, whatever else we're into these days. So again, recommended content goes based on what users are most likely to click and then read. Um, so it's using both of those data points more so than what the actual content is itself. But it uses a combination of the two and it gets incredible results, which is why the Hollywood gossip gets a 10% click through rate instead of, I don't know, a half a percent when we used uh, our old uh, kind of more related content. Okay, so we've got social, yep. social sharing. We've got recommended content. Next. And search. Search, yes. Okay, we're gonna keep going. I'm gonna try to go quick. And then the next one is subscribe. And subscribe is a whole suite of features now. And subscribe is the idea of helping you as a publisher build your newsletter. So it's getting readers to sign up for your newsletters. This is separate from Grow. This is not necessarily getting them to log into Grow, but providing you with uh, your own way of uh, building your relationship with your readers, which is extremely important. Uh, so subscribe collects basically consent on your behalf. And then we're able to share that email address with you, either through a CSV you download directly in our dashboard uh, or through Zapier can uh, hook it up direct to your ESP or email sending provider service, I think. Email sending. Yeah. Service. Email provider. Email service, service, service provider. That sounds better. Yes. So many acronyms uh, in this crazy world. There way. are. So, okay. So then, but also, so, okay. Why then if it's not connected to grow, is it a part of grow? Is it not going to get us what we need with grow? Cause I'm confused. Uh, no. And, and rightfully so. So we have this concept of what's called authenticated traffic. And again, that means a user logged into grow on your site. Uh, and so one of the things that subscribe does a great job of is that after they sign up, they just type their email address. It's a natural flow for them to finish creating the rest of their account, which can be basically one or two buttons away at that point. Once they typed in their email address, think about when you go to create an account somewhere, they're already halfway there. Uh, it's super easy to create a grow account. So it becomes almost like you can think of it as lead generation for users signing up for grow. Uh, we thought it was very important to get you that email address as quickly as we could for your newsletter so that it can become more valuable to you as a publisher. So we made that conscious decision. We don't want them to have to first log in to grow in order to then subscribe to your newsletter, or that would significantly hurt uh, your ability to grow, again, your relationship with readers. So think of it as lead generation. So uh, a good, good percentage of people do go on to create that grow account. Okay. Now. Talking about the subscribe list that we're getting from Grow, which is not related to, you don't have, yeah, I'm like, I'm, I'm not gonna try to repeat it. So the Grow list could be exported to a provider like MailChimp, AWeber, MailerLite. Yes, uh, we personally use MailChimp for our own sites, the Hollywood Gossip and Food Fanatic, and those are integrated through uh, Grow and Zapier today. Uh, it goes right to MailChimp every time someone uh, signs up in that newsletter. Okay. What is Spotlight Subscribe? So Spotlight Subscribe is probably the thing you've seen on websites. And that is what, as you're scrolling, uh, kind of grays out the rest of the page and uh, puts a spotlight on an in-content uh, newsletter subscription or subscribe widget. So it's not a pop-up, much better experience, doesn't block the whole page, doesn't drive you, your readers insane, uh, but still has pretty darn good conversion. Uh, obviously not the same as a pop-up because there's nothing like a pop-up that completely stops the user from doing anything else. Uh, but that's probably a good thing to not be running them. Uh, so Spotlight has a very high conversion, but not quite pop-up level conversions. It is awesome, guys. Yes. It works. We have it on the Media Vine corporate site. It it just works. Like, I don't know how what else to tell you. And it doesn't, like, piss people off. So works plus doesn't piss people off to me says yes. Also, it's free. Um, so, okay, we have those things. So we have an email, we have social, we have a way to multiple different ways to optimize your existing content. Those are the things that exist. Yes, Ellen just said grow is free. Ellen is correct. Grow is definitely free to Mediavine publishers. So let's do the thing that we oh. we're here to do, which is- I gotta oh, do the last one. one. It's also favorites. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. One more feature, yeah. okay. favorites. One more feature. And that is that where you see the save recipe button uh, where you can integrate with uh, WP Recipe Maker, or with one click, you can turn it on for create. Um, so both of those cards support the ability to save recipes directly to grow. And again, same thing. You can think of it as a great chance uh, where it encourages users after they save a recipe. Hey, why don't you go create a grow account uh, so that you can keep these throughout the entire internet? 
Uh, so it's a great source of lead generation, again, to getting users to log in to grow. So you should definitely be running that if you're running either WP Recipe Maker or uh, Create. Okay, what's coming? And I know that a lot of what's coming is related to subscribe because that's what, well, why? Why are, we, why are we investing so much in the subscribe features? Again, we think one of the biggest things that we're going to see the change in this next year or two is uh, publishers not just taking control of their data, so not just first-party data, but taking control of their relationship with readers. Right now, a lot of us are utterly reliant upon either uh, search traffic or social traffic, and you can't necessarily predict either of those algorithms, as we've all learned. Uh, there's an ebb and flow with both of those sources, and it's great if you balance between the two of them, but there's a third one, and this is why people love newsletters so much is it's your control. You pick when you send. It's your relationship with the reader. Uh, so we think subscribe is going to be incredibly important uh, in the new era of the internet coming in the next few years. Um, so we're betting real hard on subscribe and helping our publishers grow their newsletters. Uh, but also subscribe is a great source of, again, like I said, people to sign up for grow. Uh, so there's another reason we're doubling down. We're making sure that we're helping you build authenticated traffic and your newsletters simultaneously. How are we doing it? Uh, so a big feature that's coming in addition to Spotlight is going to be, or Spotlight's already out, but the next big feature is we call exclusive content. So exclusive content is the idea of you can mark either sections of a page or an entire page uh, that only users who have logged in and subscribed to your newsletter can get access to. Uh, the conversion is unbelievable. Uh, it'll actually leave uh, pop-ups in the dust with how well it converts people to your newsletter. Uh, they may find it as annoying or more annoying than a pop-up though, fair warning. Uh, but if you pick the content that it does well on, so content that truly is exclusive and they should give you something in return, uh, you can drive significant uh, newsletter growth. And more importantly, because they are actually now creating a full grow account and logging in to get it, you're also getting that authenticated traffic. So every one of those users will make you more money and sign up to your newsletter to hopefully come back. And it's not going to be nearly as annoying as the New York Times, which is, is not, we're talking about a free wall, not a paywall. We're not yes. asking people to pay. All we're asking them to do is consent to being served personalized ads. Yeah. And again, the login yeah. process is incredibly easy for Grow. And the beauty of Grow is if they create an account once uh, the, uh, on, let's say, My Baking Addiction, and then go head to the Hollywood Gossip. Yes, that same account works on both. They're still going to be asked to subscribe to your newsletter, but they won't have to create a new account in order to get access to that exclusive content. So as you see this adopted by more and more sites, it becomes less and less friction to a reader. Uh, okay. We have a, how will exclusive content impact SEO? Love that question. Uh, because I knew you would. Because <laughs> it was designed by Mediavine, you can imagine that that was one of the first things we worried about and tested. So there's actually a Google schema for paywalls or also for free walls, where you mark which of your content is behind that free wall. Uh, Google is not crazy. They know that now most of the web is behind these kind of paywalls. Uh, you see almost every news organization has moved to them. Uh, spoiler, again, third party cookies are going away. First party relationships are all that matters. Uh, follow what they're doing. Uh, it, it is what we are now doing, or we're giving access to independent content creators to do the same. So it does not impact SEO because we use that markup that Google asks you to. And we've already tested this and have been testing it on both the Hollywood Gossip, Food Fanatic, and some of our own internal uh, employees who run blogs. We've been testing on our sites. No drop in rankings at all for running this because, again, we use uh, that schema markup. Love that there is a schema markup for it. I mean, yes, exactly. Okay. So in terms of subscribe, I've, heard, I've understood that there are some specific features coming to that that people are asking for that I've been requesting and we are doing it because we, while subscribe has been our chief driver here, primarily so far, what we've seen is that the majority of our conversions for grow are coming through the subscribe feature. So with that being true, what if I don't have a newsletter? So that's a great question. We want everyone to be able to run subscribe, right? We want everyone at Mediavine. It is going to be that the way that we all come out ahead and it, we recognize that there is a very large percentage of Mediavine publishers that don't have a newsletter today. Uh, running a newsletter is both expensive and often uh, very time consuming. Uh, people that do newsletters and do it well, 
put significant time into them. Uh, as you can listen to many lives that we've done with people that are very good at this. And it sounds yep. incredibly daunting probably when you hear people talk about it. A lot of people are like, sign up for one of these email classes and they're like, I still can't do this myself because of the time commitment or again, no cost. time. And it takes setup time to get there just because you started immediately. It's not going to instantly start giving you an ROI. So you're talking about taking time from something else and putting it in that bucket for no promise return. Right. So one thing we're building is kind of a, a newsletter light, a, a solution for people that are getting into newsletters. They'll be able to turn on this feature within grow and grow will take care of sending out your newsletters automatically for you. It's going to use our recommended content engine along with uh, the new content that you're posting and making sure that we are sending out uh, newsletters automatically on your behalf to your readers that have subscribed. Again, this is a feature that is optional, uh, but this is great for people that do not have newsletters or even if you do have a newsletter, it's something you might want to consider. I cannot wait to retire the manual effort going on for our own sites and hand it over on something like the Hollywood Gossip and Food Tank where we do have existing newsletters. Uh, so it's something that is for both people that don't have one, uh, but really important for people that, uh, again, uh, sorry, it's most important for people that don't have one, but even great for people that do. I can't, I can't say enough, but um, I think Betsy said it for us all, which is the <laughs> comment that's currently posted, which is shut the front door, Eric. So and I think that's the best part that I haven't even said. Uh, it's going to be free. Uh, uh, so our, what? Right. So they, there will be no charge to our publishers uh, for running uh, these newsletters. So no cost based on the number of subscribers or number of contacts or number of emails you send. It's just a feature you turn on. And if they signed up for a grow account um, and subscribed or we will send on your behalf for free. Betsy wants us to also shut the back door, which means we have locked someone inside your house. And that's what we're doing. That's how we're building your first party data and authenticated users. Exactly. Exactly. Betsy. Uh, okay. We have a whole, whole lot of other questions here, but the primary one is, what is the time frame for this newsletter light? Uh, I can tell you something that we're actively working on today. I, again, I stay away from dates these days after the, the fun trials launch, uh, but not should be, to. I know, not allowed to give dates anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. Coming soon. Again, our goal is this, this one is definitely coming this year because it's a thing we're actively working on today. So your recommendation is, because we've had a lot of people say, I don't have a newsletter. Turn it on now because you will have a way to have a newsletter, even if you don't want to take the turn on subscribe, turn on the spotlight feature, start collecting those users yeah. now. Do it. Yeah, I think right? yes. I, I would recommend running it even today. Even if, you, again, you don't have a newsletter today, we're going to help you get one in the future if you don't have one. And again, this is newsletter light. We think it's still a path to everyone should have their own newsletter. So even if you're starting with newsletter light in the future, we still want to help you grow that relationship with your readers. And the only way to do that is if you start collecting uh, those subscribers now. It takes a long time to build up an audience. It's also a way to test it. Like you could never test it before without investing great amounts of time and at least some money to get uh, to get a, an account started with one of the ESPs. This is a way to test it out. See what's going on. See if it actually is something that's converting for you. You're driving traffic to your site. All of those things. Then, yeah, you can go back in and do it. Okay. We have so many questions. One of them is, one of the things that you talked about a lot in your um, in your blog post was, this is the year that publishers take back their relationships with readers. Can you tell me, like, first of all, I love that concept. You told it, to, you, you said it to me in Slack. I got very excited. I want to know what you mean by that with Grow and, and why it's so important that we do it at this juncture. Because what I'm hearing you say all the things, and I, I don't want to make a big deal out of it. We all know I'm dramatic. But I don't want to make a bigger deal out of it than it is. But everything I'm hearing sounds like, the web is changing pretty significantly. And, and so there's really no way to not do some significant changes with it. So tell us what you mean by this. Yeah. So again, I, I think you don't have to look any further than going to most major news sites to know the future of the web does not look like what it looks like today. Um, you can yeah. already see the changes happening. Um, so it's very important. We all get in on this early as we can. The reason I'm saying that I think uh, that this is the year we take back ownership of that is you have to look at what are traditionally called the walled gardens or places like Facebook. Uh, when you get traffic from Facebook, uh, it's great, but it's an anonymous user that came to your site from Facebook. And then they go back to Facebook when they're done. Same thing with Pinterest, same thing with Google. As much as we love all three of those as traffic sources to our sites, at the end of the day, it is their traffic. 
It is theirs to take and give as they see fit. And again, those readers don't look at it as I visited or whatever you do. They look at it as I clicked on a recipe from Pinterest. Think about how non-bloggers talk about the websites they visit. I saw this recipe on Pinterest. They certainly don't even know your blog name. This is our chance to change that. We can become the destinations for our readers. And that's the thing that newsletters give us. When they get an inbox, it's personalized. It's from your site. They didn't go and say, oh, uh, I got this email um, from Pinterest and clicked on it. No, they got this email from or whatever you do. It is your relationship with the reader. Uh, and this is the year I think that it becomes a big deal because it's going to be such a big part of your first party data strategy as well. Because again, they came from your email in, inbox. You know who they are, right? In the same way that Facebook knew who that reader was because they came from Facebook. Now you're going to know who they are. So it's a relationship that you have with your readers. Uh, and it's going to be able to, again, be a source of your first party data. So incredibly important to the future of our publishers. It's so I want to expand upon the concept that you just said, because that identification is very important that, as you said, yeah, we all say, I got that recipe on Pinterest. No, no, actually didn't. Pinterest doesn't have any recipes. You got that from an independent content creator. So um, mic drop. So, but it, it's about more than just one site. And that's why we're doing something called Grow for the World. But I want to hear why it's important that it's about one, more than one site, because it's about this just the same way that Mediavine, when we started providing full service ad management, was was about a group of publishers banding together. It's the same thing, right? Like we're it's not just about one one website. It's about all of us. Yeah, no, I, I think look, some of us have, and I know Jenny loves this word from uh, uh, the super fans, right? We all have uh, these yeah. super fans that absolutely follow your site, know who you are, and are your loyal homepage users that come by. But you got to think about the ninety nine percent of other publishers that come to your site. They don't know you from Adam. Is that the expression? Uh, and they're not necessarily going to uh, want to create an account, want to sign up for your newsletter or do any of that work. They don't know who you are. Again, they came from Pinterest. But if we all band together under one thing, such as Grow, um, and we give them one login, they'll know and start to trust Grow. As they see it on sites, they'll think of it as a way to add benefit as they're browsing that site. They're not going to look at it as necessarily, uh, it's not going to overtake your brand identity, don't worry, in the way that something like a Pinterest or Google does, because it is something that is built into your site. Grow is still not the destination. Your site is the destination and Grow is built into your site. So Grow becomes value add to your site and your site becomes that identification. But again, it's important that there's one login system or you're going to be asking readers to create thousands of different logins which I'm sure you all personally hate as much as I do when you have to create a login for every single thing. I use, uh, whenever they offer it, login with Google or login with Facebook, just to not create yet another password. Uh, I'm going to forget which password I used on. Um, and so it's extremely important that we don't have to do that across the entire web as this web is changing or it's going to be a bad user experience and users are just not going to log in. And rather than banding together with Mark Zuckerberg, you're banding together with other independent content creators. That's the, that's the web that we're creating here. It's with other people that are doing the same thing you're doing. Yeah. Right. I think one of the most important things to look at is you may look at this as yet maybe a new walled garden, but publishers have never been in on the walled garden or controlled the walled garden or been the walled garden. And that's what we're building in this new web. The idea of we are the new Facebook. We are the new Pinterest combined. We were already giving all of those sites the content, but now we're going to get the readers direct. Uh, that is the concept behind Grow. Uh, we can all do this together and we can be the walled garden together this time around. Four publishers, five publishers, a walled guard, our walled garden. Okay, I love it. So in our, in our little bit of time that we have remaining, what about, uh, how, how are we going to involve other, other sites uh, that may not necessarily be at the Mediavine traffic threshold. We had someone ask earlier about a smaller site that they themselves had. Their main site is with Mediavine. They have a smaller site that isn't quite to our traffic threshold. Can they use Grow on that site? Yeah, so I think Grow has unbelievable uh, growth already from just the existing Mediavine publishers. But if we want to truly become the next Pinterest, become the next Facebook, 
it has to go beyond just Mediavine publishers. We need the entire internet banding together. Uh, and so with that in mind, uh, we are working this year extremely aggressively to work on what we call Grow for the World internally, uh, just a nickname, not the, not the final name. Uh, but that is we're going to open up Grow to the entire world. We don't just want it to be Mediavine publishers because in order to be truly successful and for all of us uh, to rise together, uh, we need as many sites as possible running Grow. So beyond just Mediavine publishers. Uh, and that is coming again soon. Uh, and that will not be just for large publishers. So if you want it for your secondary sites, uh, Grow is going to be available. So how does this impact what we talked about in your in your post? And we've been we had questions about it forever, an offering for smaller websites. Yeah. So one of the things as we've made this decision is uh, to, to really open up Grow to the entire Internet. Uh, is we'd rather move that ad offering, which was originally going to be inside of Mediavine, over to Grow. It's not going to be a big fundamental change from you as a publisher's perspective. It's still going to be Mediavine ad technology, uh, but we think it's a better fit for Grow because it's going to help the sustainability of us releasing this Grow product. Um, so that ad offering will be uh, available uh, to smaller publishers than the Mediavine requirements, uh, and even to different sites that may not have previously qualified for Mediavine even for non uh, necessarily traffic related, uh, it's gonna be a more diverse set of publishers uh, outside of maybe more of the lifestyle sites you're used to seeing at Mediavine. Okay, so we're gonna broaden it. For anybody who wants to use Grow eventually, they'll be able to, this will be our offering for smaller websites that are working to get to the Mediavine ad management level. They'll be able to use Grow to monetize their sites, but also use all those features of Grow that we've been talking about and whatever comes down the road to keep growing, to reach that 50,000 or whatever the threshold is. And in addition, we're going to be able to create this amazing web of content creators that actually make it even more worth it for people to create a login. We want Grow to be the, the way that they consume their content. That's what we want to create for users, correct? Exactly. No, small All right. It's small. It's, it's not big. It's just, it's minor. Um, okay, so we have two minutes. Tell us what our publishers need to do in 2020, uh, 2022. It is 2022. I just need to confirm. Yes. What do they need to do? Uh, if you are not running Grow today, opt in to Grow if you're a Mediavine publisher. It is available right now on your dashboard. Turn it on. But more importantly, you need to start again building that relationship with your readers. And the only way you can do that today uh, and have complete control is by turning on subscribe and building your newsletter. Uh, and again, we'll be offering that newsletter kind of light features, name pending, definitely not called newsletter light. Uh, will be, again, a great offering if you don't have one, but you also want to think about creating one even at, during that feature if you haven't already, because it is your relationship with your readers. Incredibly important you start growing that today. It takes years to build a big subscriber base. So the best time to start was, you know, a year ago when we launched this feature, but the second best time is right now. Uh, so enable it today. Fantastic. There are additional, and, and I know that there are additional features coming out for subscribe. There's so much coming um, with exclusive content, all the different ways to entice your readers to log in to grow, to sign up for your email list, to engage more with your site and with other content creator sites that are also using grow. So it's an exciting 2022. I apologize if we didn't get to all your questions. There were quite a few, but the TLDR version of all of this, we've already had somebody say they need to watch this live like 20 times, which is a lot of us. That's like a whole lot. But um, if you don't want to watch 20 times, uh, the TLDR is go turn on Grow if you're not running it. If you are running Grow and you don't have subscribe, turn that on right now. And we will be back in just a couple of weeks with our uh, next episode. It's Tuesday, January 25th at noon central. We've got Maureen Wangi coming on. She's going to talk about a way to build a brand that uh, she's used with multiple major brands out on the market. So we're excited to have her. Eric, it is always a pleasure. Happy 2022. Oh, happy 2022, not 2022. Right. Sorry, exactly.